Welcome back, Perfect Peeps, to Perfect.dev. Today on the show, we have Lauren Lee, also known as Lolo Coding. Welcome, Lauren. Hey, hello. So you might know Lauren from the We Belong podcast. She is the host there. She is also a director of community at Puppet and has worked for companies such as Amazon, GoDaddy, and Vonage. Lauren has a, had a very unique path, spending 10 years as a high school teacher and department chair, and then attending a coding boot camp and becoming a software engineer. Today, we're going to talk all about fostering developer education. I'm so excited about this topic, Lauren. Yeah, ditto. It's um, my most uh, passionate area. I um, love developer education, and it's all I really think about these days. So yeah. <laughs> happy to chat about it. Awesome. So I know I've, I've kind of listened to a few of your podcasts and some of your journey, hey, but thanks. would you mind like talking about like how the heck you went from a teacher to like this whole yeah. new career? <laughs> Yes, I am um, a career transitioner through and through. I spent a decade teaching high school English and I loved it. I deeply, deeply loved it. It was um, so fun uh, to make a difference in students' lives. And I realized near the end of my career that I felt really, oh gosh, how do I say this? Five paragraph essay, which is what I was teaching day in, day out is a pretty antiquated thing. And so I suddenly realized like, what am I helping them prepare for in the real world? So I had to do some introspection and some, you know, pause of, am I helping them prepare for the world? And is there more that I could be doing for them? And the answer came to me when I was, um, I was with my students. We it was very experiential school. We had traveled to Zambia and we wow. have a sister school there and uh, where my students were partnering with the school there and teaching. They were they had set up a computer lab over the years and my students were teaching coding, basic yeah. HTML, CSS, a dabble of JavaScript here <laughs> and there. And I'm sitting in the back of the classroom as a chaperone on the trip. And I'm watching them talk about these things. I'm like, this is what coding is? Like, wait, that's kind of cool. They're like, yeah, Lauren, get with the program. This is <laughs> this, this is what we do all day. Or like, this is what our school teaches us also. You know, your English class is one portion of our day. Uh, so yeah, good zoomed out lens of that. And I realized that then watching my students um, struggle a bit to make connections with the with the students there and my students were really privileged had come from a really wealthy place in seattle and it was only when they were sitting in front of a computer with a website in front of them trying to build something together collaboratively that i discovered that they were able to like start building bridges essentially and wow. yeah. they're sitting there like oh i like what should we make a website on um i like ocean animals. Okay, me too. Okay, that's a very minimal, like small, basic thing to have in common. But once you have that, you can build. And so then they're building something together and creating and really lovely foundational like relationships were established in those moments. So I discovered there's power there, right? There's something about community that it allows us to drive forward. And so I got really kind of hooked and curious. I, I had a notebook with me that trip that I was building out you know, HTML pages wow. and being like, what would this look like? Very old school. We didn't have computers for me to play with it there. Sure. And the students would run it for me and be like, this is what that looks like. Oh, <laughs> so, so I came cool. back and my students, um, yeah, I kind of got to switch from being the teacher expert to a student with them. They would send me Code Academy resources oh. and kind of encourage me to build different things. And they then were checking in on me almost as though it was my homework to yeah. see how I was doing with my learning. And they were so proud of me and excited for me that it kind of fueled my curiosity and passion. So that was what I was doing after school that year uh, and building my understanding and, you know, I got hooked as yeah. a lot of people I think we talk to, you know, when you have that kind of light bulb moment of like, I can do this, this isn't magic and I <laughs> can create something. And I really fell in love with that feeling of being a student again, that was really important yeah. for me because That's I had amazing. been the keeper of the knowledge and I was the English teacher. I knew the things about Shakespeare <laughs> and I expelled it to my students. And so it just was really wonderful. And I kind of started Googling, like, how could I, you know, is it the self-taught journey? Should I yeah. 
is there something for me out there? I'm broke. I'm a teacher. I make no money. I couldn't afford a boot camp. Uh, th- I didn't think I could. And so I think I typed in like free boot camps <laughs> and Ada developers popped up in my search in my Google search. And was, was this like during your summer break or was this, this was that school that next school year? So it was a okay. summer break that we were in Zambia, came back okay. during the school year. Um, you know, it's it's that that final year of my teaching ends up, it ends up being. Um, but in the evenings I'm Googling, like, how can I make this more of a career? I start going to meetups and I start meeting people that are coders and I'm like, wow, that's cool. Like I'm so want to know more. And I would go to every meetup. It didn't matter if it was an iOS. It didn't matter if it was a Java DevOps. I went to everything. I knew nothing. And I wrote it all down in my notebook and I would go home and I would Google the terms and build, wow. start building a definition dictionary for myself. You just built that spark. So I just, yeah, like it's super exciting. I just was, I was just, it was opening a whole world to me that I had no clue about. I'm not, I was really technically unadjacent is what we call it at Ada Developers Academy. There's no one in our tight circle um, that is a developer that I was always very envious of my classmates who had a partner at home who could help them with their homework or something like that, that they were, you know, a senior software engineer at Amazon. And I was like, oh, I don't have someone helping with my homework, but uh, yeah. So I, 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 I happened to discover Ada Developers Academy in that search and it's the most incredible place in the entire world. It is a tuition free coding boot camp for women and gender diverse folk that is an wow. entire year long program. Uh, and it happened to be in Seattle, Washington, where I was living. <laughs> so that's helpful. <laughs> I, I mean, it all fell into place. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. I was, I was gonna ask you, like, uh, I hear you like you Googled, you found this thing, but was, so their, their mission statement is to provide women and gender diverse individuals the skills they need. Was that mm-hmm. also a reason you picked it though? Other, uh, outside 100%. of maybe there was other options? Everything about Ada, lined up with me and my values, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, everything that they, their mission and kind of what they were trying to achieve to diversify tech felt aligned to what I wanted. And so it, I went all in on (laughs) apply. It's a very brutal application process. And I put all my eggs in that basket. I thought this is the way I'm, if I don't get in this round, I will get in the next, I will continue trying because this is where I want to be. This is the community I want to learn in. And I was really fortunate to um, gain entry that time I applied and I quit my job the very next day. Or, you know, I put in notice that that was my first, yeah. you know, I'm not coming back next year. And this, I think the program started up in August. So it is was it you only, know, really great timing. <laughs> is it only on location or do they have remote options for that? They were, they were in person forever, uh, up until COVID and they yeah. are now, we have a distributed way as well and applications are open right now. So folks That's awesome. apply. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Everybody kind of had to transition. We'll, uh, we'll put, yeah. we'll add that for you. That'd be awesome. Absolutely. I am I'm such an advocate and I'm so grateful for the opportunities mm-hmm. that they provided. The way that it works is that how it functions to be fully tuition free and fully funded program is that we get sponsor companies Mm -hmm. to pay for a spot of a student. And first off, that checks a box for their diversity, equity, inclusion, that they are, you know, supporting a program such as Ada, but then they also get an intern and Mm -hmm. they, that we stay there for five months. So it's a much longer internship program than a summer one was. And we then get a foot in the door. That's how I ended up at Amazon as I interned there. And it, I mean, it's incredible opportunities because once I got that Amazon checkbox on my resume, that opened up a lot of that doors for me. More. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Yeah. So I've, I've worked on and off with uh, boot camps here in West Michigan yeah. and uh, those always have a tuition base. Even if there's large companies backing them, they still like to support their their teachers and things like that. Like they have to, right. they have to go through that. But I'm I'm kind of curious. Um, you said like you were broke. You were a teacher. For for other people mm-hmm. to go into this, it still sounds like though, like you didn't get paid probably either for five or six months, right? Yes. So the six months in class portion is you are without. Um, 
income. So I had some savings. I thought I would be able to sustain myself. I went into debt and that was very, very overwhelming. Um, luckily, um, once you switch into the internship portion, you do get paid the $16 minimum wage, $16 an hour in Seattle. Um, oh, wow. And so that you know, is enough to live on during those five month times. So it's six months in the classroom, five months in, in the internship. Um, and, and that was, that was full 40 hours a week. Yep. Yep. Nice. Absolutely. And we do on Thursdays, we would do computer science fundamentals. It's really difficult as a boot camp to include understand like, um, all of those pieces kind of end up getting skipped. And so folks that then enter the job market and try to do interviews with whiteboarding, that becomes a massive gatekeeping moment, right? Where yeah. I'm not able to search a binary tree you know, or, or traverse a tree or, or even understand big O notation. So they, did, they were very thoughtful in giving us really crammed bit amount of information um, every single Thursday that we would have in our curriculum on how to kind of nail that uh, wow. and understand what they're asking of you in that moment and how to even approach a problem in that way. And while I think that that is a really antiquated way of interviewing and it's not how I hire, it is how some companies do still. So yeah. it's just important to be aware of. And we have an incredible community of alum that you know, we're a part of a whisper network, if you will, of like, here are the great companies that are welcoming to uh, career changers and boot campers and uh, have incredible, you know, interview processes and uh, ask you to code along with them as opposed to stand in front of us in a whiteboard. So uh, it's, it's, that all kind of plays into itself as well, so that we try to positively amplify the companies that are doing good and removing those gatekeeping moments from their, their onboarding. How was the classroom format? Was it a, like a typical school day or did school. Would, could you have had a part-time job if you had needed one? No, a hundred percent not. And that mm -hmm. is, that is the moment of privilege that I absolutely need to acknowledge that I was able to, for those six months, you know, live off of, uh, of my savings, eventual debt. Mm -hmm. And I, it is from nine to five. It was more class okay. than I've ever done in my entire life. I have a master's and it was way harder than that. Like it was um, in, in, incredibly. I mean, in not knowing <laughs> that much about coding, right? Oh, not at all. Not at all. Now they require oh, no. a bit more knowledge. And I think it was really nice. We all had a very similar. I talked to a lot of uh, folks that I mentor now that are doing boot camps. And it seems like some programs allow for folks to have a wide variety of backgrounds or knowledge, if you will, of experience within code. So it's really tough if you're someone who has never even built anything or like opened up their terminal. And then they have people that have freelanced or, you know, been, uh, have had education or, you know, prior experience. It's just yeah. then that that's like imposter syndrome, but, uh, we were all at the same level. We, none of us had any experience and it was cool. all about collaboration and we were never competitive with one another. It was about like, how can we all get jobs in the industry? There's room for all of us at the top and just really supportive in that regard because I'm not a competitive person myself. And so I needed something that would be really, you know, encouraging in that regard versus, um, a brutal cutthroat program that it, it, you'll hear people talk about, oh, I was the number one in my boot camp. We would never know something like that. That was not the philosophy, pedagogically wise, of the program at all. So I, I, there's that word again. I know. Yeah. I'm in two podcasts. This is amazing. Yeah. Two Pedagogy. Nope. <laughs> yeah. We, we had to look it up last time. We're, we're getting better at it now. Awesome. Well, yeah. So, yeah. So that's where my, training my, you know, I went to school to be a teacher. Um, I struggled with learning a lot as a kid. I, I'm incredibly dyslexic and I didn't learn to read until fourth grade. And once someone helped me kind of, again, back to that aha moment, make sense mm -hmm. of it. I realized, oh my gosh, there's so much power in this giving back and helping someone understand and feel confident in it. And I, yeah, it felt like the absolute next step for me in my career was to be a teacher. And it, it, it was so important to me to give back, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel the same way. I, I've had similar struggles, actually. And I've, I've found uh, throughout my career that a lot of people in technology have similar, like dyslexic 
like yep. tendencies and things like that. And yeah. um, I, I always talk to people about how I have to see something in a picture to put it together in my mm-hmm. mind. And they're like, why? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, it goes back to that fact. Like it took me forever to like learn how to read and stuff like that. So that's kind of mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah, it's so interesting. Um, sorry. So that we kind of, we did a couple of loops here. And I spiraled. And down a, <laughs> a, 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 kind of a train here with uh, your Amazon experience. And yeah. so, so you actually started out in your internship on the yes. team? So the way what, that we... How incredible that? I know, what an Especially incredible opportunity. Especially like an English teacher, right? <laughs> oh my, I mean, I, I showed up day one. <laughs> What's everyone's favorite book? What are we reading <laughs> right now? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it was a team of developers. They were like, do you play video games? And I said, no, I thought we'd be... Re-. Yeah, anyway, it was not what I expected. But I was... um incredible opportunity. The way that we do internship placement is we do kind of prep of preview of what loops look like. So I'm sorry, my dogs are barking in the background. I'm not in my recording studio. So hope that's okay. Um, totally fine. We're, okay. we're in COVID time. <laughs> You're in COVID. Uh, yes. So we met with a lot of the different hiring companies and did interviews with them to kind of learn that what it feels like to be in front of someone and have to whiteboard and, you know, ask, answer those behavioral answers and or questions. And we, um, I met with the, the Amazon team and it was an immediate connection. Their hiring manager was just like, you've got to come be on our team. You've got to join us. So the Kindle team, I interviewed with them and it was a mutual, like I really wanted to go to that. We kind of got to rank all the five different, and we have incredible sponsors at Ada. It's, you know, Zillow, Indeed, Amazon, Google. So there's really awesome opportunities. Um, Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos's um, space company. There's, you know, just really, and then some startups too. So, you know, companies in Seattle that are wanting to support Ada have opportunities to, of course, they found the squeaker, you guys, <laughs> uh, to, to sponsor and then get an intern um, for those five months. And yeah, we um, I ended up on that Kindle team and we were managing a program called Charts. So the New York Times has a bestseller list, right? They publish mm-hmm. their the, the books that are most purchased across the country each week. What Amazon has is Kindle data and Audible data. So what they would publish is the most read. What are people actually finishing on their Kindles and listening to to completion? Uh, because that's more interesting than like, well, we can we know what books people are opening, but not actually reading. Yep. Yeah. And we know what books people are binging and can't put down. And so it was playing around with that data and seeing what interesting stories we could tell about that and help people you know, oh, you live in this particular geographic area. Um, let's, like, people seem to be excited about this particular title or uh, uh, demographic groups. How could we target and kind of help people find their next read? Based that is on so what cool others are- that you transitioned was- from being an English teacher to being a student back to being, like, kind of learning and then doing literature. Like, you were doing charts on literature. Data analytics. <laughs> it was insane. It was insane. And I listened to how I built this, the podcast quite oh, yeah. a bit. And Guy Raz right. at the end always asks, you know, is it luck or is it, you know, hard work? It's all luck for me. Like, this is all just the all I could, you know, you hear all of it and it's a like, right place, right time, serendipity, um, just pure so, luck that I ended up in that place. So my, my wife and I listen to, to that pod religiously. And yeah. what what she always says, and I have to agree with, is that luck favors the prepared. And yeah. I have to tell you, like the way you went at this and like wrote the mm-hmm. notes and like just dug in, I I have to stick with you were prepared or being yeah. prepared for you immersed that yourself moment. in the community. I, I cannot tell you how all in I went on it. Like, I mean, my poor friends and family at that time, because it was all I talked about, thought about, um, you know, I just, every single night, it, I was living in a really lucky place in Seattle. There was a meetup every single night of the week to go to any sort of tech piece. So I found uh, a really incredible Ruby community and a really cool react group. 
once I discovered DevRel, those were the communities that I was able to test talks and start practice. Like I had a community, a little wonderful place where I could workshop things with them. Yeah. And like that all led itself well to my career then in the future too. So yeah, if you, if you talk lucky and, but you took the opportunities too. And that's why I always want to get back to people is they're out there. You just have to go. And if you want to work like Lauren is working like at this, mm -hmm. guess what? Yeah. You'll find those opportunities. And I always say uh, advice I give to mentees is ask for what you want. Like ask someone if you're working, if you have coffee with them, ask them to review your resume, ask them to, or whatever it is that you need from them. Can I get a referral into the company? Uh, and can I, like, how do I, what are the things that you recommend I, I take on to do what you're doing right now? And that was what, once I discovered DevRel, that, or developer relations, it was the same aha moment for me as well. I, I wasn't really thriving as a strict developer or like a software engineer, I, I was missing wearing all the hats that a teacher does. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was craving something beyond just creating what my product manager told me to. Uh, and so I, I began attending conferences and I, I discovered the world of developer relations. And that was when I realized, oh, I could be really technical, but I could also be back to that educator place and share my learnings with the world. And so that was when things really clicked into alignment for me, if you will. That's yeah. incredible. Mm -hmm. So, so you've kind of, you've, you've gone through your internship. I assume they either have the choice to hire you on full time or you then have the choice to yep. go to something else. Did you choose to I, stay within Amazon? I stayed on, I stayed on okay. and I, I left Amazon once, once a manager shared with me that I was their diversity hire and mm -hmm. that they were done hiring diverse. They didn't need to anymore because they had a woman and they were good. That's and I could have so for me, I have to, I have a podcast about celebrating diversity in tech. I cannot be a checkbox for someone. I need to be somewhere that values me as as a Lauren, yeah. as a developer. What I bring to the yeah. table, not like gender for, shouldn't matter. Your ethnicity right. shouldn't matter. So that was a that was a um, moral walkout moment, and mm -hmm. I was lucky to find GoDaddy who funnily enough, has a historical context or history of being pretty mass, like misogynistic um, in their marketing and yeah. um, commercials. Super but Bowl, they, Super Bowl ads for yeah, sure. remember how nasty and gross those were, but yeah. they, their new CEO, their new leadership team is all new, hmm. or really thoughtful, addressed it day one, like very much got ahead of it. And we're like, we want to be different. We want to acknowledge how awful that was. We want to be a part of the change. And we want you to be a part of that too. And so that really, that lined up again with all of everything that I care about. And it felt important to yeah. me to find somewhere that really valued what I brought to the table. Uh, and so that, that's how I ended up there. And at, at GoData, you were the technical product manager, correct? Yes, I was. I had the opportunity to do some internal evangelism. So I was working with a tech team and I um, was, we were, essentially trying to get other developers to adopt the tools that we were building. And that gave me the opportunity to kind of workshop talks and put together pitches of why someone would want to potentially use our product and what the drawbacks are and, and really practice dev rel, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to be more technical than they, they, I wanted to continue writing code and they, it wasn't really within their understanding of a, of a PM you know, participating in like, you know, yep. picking up a ticket. And so we just, we, <laughs> we wanted to make it work. It was third great, incredible uh, community. And they were really supportive of me wanting to start a podcast and wanting to give back to my community and to speak at conferences and all of those sort of things. So it was um, a great launch pad for me to then find, eventually I, I ended up at Vonage, which is my, was where I had my first developer relations role and was their first developer educator hire and eventually wound up managing a team of eight people of, of developer educators. So it grew in a great bit of time while I was there and was really um, just a wonderful way to blend all of my interests and to stay super, I was incredibly technical, but also 
writing tutorials, writing blog or videos and uh, YouTube videos. We started a Twitch stream. All of the different ways to meet developers where they exist online was what our goal was. So it was really cool opportunity. And you got to do more back into the code. Exactly. I got to go back a hundred percent. I, yes, I, I, I wanted to stay as technical as possible because I think that's really important in developer relations to have the authentic buy-in yeah. of your community who are developers to know that I can build, you know, yeah, like, if you're not coding, you're not, you're no, it doesn't from, work. Like, yeah. Out of touch with what they yeah. are experiencing. Yeah, exactly. So that, yeah, it was just, um, it was, perfect opportunity. We got to, we, you know, Vonage has a ton of telecommunication APIs. So I got to think of fun ideas of why would someone want to send an SMS? Why would they want to have a video call uh, or a voice call and then build an app and then talk about that? Like, so I was just building things I wanted and then telling people about it. That's awesome. It, it was so cool. And once I became, I eventually moved into the manager world there and it was so fun because I was then able to tell my whole team any idea that they had, I could say, yeah, do it. Like, how fun is that to be the enabler who just says yes, yeah, like, be the yes cool. person. Yeah. yeah, like, I mean, <laughs> you radical have a cool idea. You yeah, have. like, you get an app. <laughs> yeah, like, you want to make an IoT monitor, you know, just ridiculous ideas. Yeah. But I, I, it was really cool to be able to just encourage that creativity and, I don't know, just push, pushing boundaries of what's possible. And it's okay to fail too. And be like, yeah. especially with Twitch, like we had a lot of flops and- Twitch is rough. Uh, Twitch oh, yeah. is a little rough. <laughs> well, we, we had never started streaming. We had no presence as a channel uh, in early 2020. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll run with it. I'll, I'll see what I can do with this. And COVID came and suddenly we had all these developer advocates that were used to be traveling on yeah. the road, giving talks that suddenly were grounded, stuck at home, wanting to connect with their communities, but didn't know how to actually like get in front of them. And so quickly we had an, we started streaming eight times a week, eight different shows wow. on our channel. That's and so had a lot of like management of that, which was really fun. Yeah. But again, it was like any idea, who's got an idea? You can stream. We have an open spot on the calendar. Um, and my stream was just about getting people to come and practice or try on streaming and see how it felt. And then if they had fun with it, I'd be like, guess what? You're going You're really up. on Tuesdays. <laughs> yeah. So it was really cool. So I, I think it was really important to walk through kind of your journey and understand like you, you were a teacher and I, I feel like you must have like that teaching like need inside of you that you need to let out. But can you like kind of start to, so fostering developer education is the title of the pod. And what, yes. what I, what I want to talk through is, you know, we've thrown out terms like developer relations, developer advocacy, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're I think your title there at Vonage was developer educator. Yeah, I manage the developer education team. Yep. There you go. Um, yep. So how does all that intermix and why would a company like pay all these people to yes. do all those random oh, things? Oh, that's a great Can question. talk about so, that? <laughs> yes. Um, so developer relations, um, a developer advocate or a developer educator um, or perhaps a You'll, you'll hear the word evangelist sometimes also. They function as the um, representative in tech communities of the, co they're the company representation. Of, let me say that again. <laughs> they are in the company representation of the tech communities that they're passionate about and represent the, you know, the users, the people who, the developers that are excited to use the product. In the tech communities, they represent the company and they kind of share that back and forth of information and inform the roadmap or feature roadmap of what might happen at the company based on what the community wants. And so um, it's someone who is tightly coupled to both, but is in the community, not as a salesperson, is there to authentically hear the needs and hopes and dreams and goals of a tech community developers and bring that back to the, the company so that they understand genuinely what people are wanting uh, and to do that in a really organic way so that it doesn't feel, you know, developers are phobic of adverse, maybe is probably a better word of sales, marketing, et cetera. And so it never, it tries to stay very far away from that particular lens. 
So would a mediator be kind of yes. the word that you would use, like between yeah. the company and the developers? Yeah. So you get a that switchboard operator. Company. Yeah, that's yeah. like really pr- that exists in the communities and is a participant in that and 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 has a product for their company and says, "Have you considered X?" But also, like, it's I'm not going to push it. I'm not going to say that this is the universal solution that you should use for everything, right? Like that yeah. might not be the best case or that thing that you need right now. And so uh, to help, to care more about that problem and to help them find a solution is the important thing. And to know that this might not be a good solution for you right now, but maybe in the future it might be. Uh, and so for you to always think back fondly of that product and think, oh, well, Lauren really liked working with that and I trust her. So maybe I should consider it now that I have this particular new problem that is juicy and I want to, you know, I need some fun, innovative solutions for. So So is having that uh, teacher mentality, like what made you want to do that journey back after becoming a student again, and then going back, going back into developer? (laughs) Exactly. This space was something where I would never plateau. I would never know everything. I was always encouraged to learn something new and to try whether it was a different language of one of our SDKs that we had or uh, an API that we had. So I was always pushed to continue building, growing, and being a student, and then just breaking it down into consuming. Yeah, exactly. And I, I was then tasked to break it down into consumable parts to a whole. And I I did that well because I was a teacher. I knew how to structure content so that it wasn't overwhelming and it wasn't um, to, you know, that um, just like do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. That's super boring. Um, You have to explain that, like, why, why am I approaching the problem this way? And then helping someone learn that critical thinking in a new innovative way that they may not have approached a problem before. So all of those things kind of factored together. So from a, from a company's perspective, why would I pay these people to do this? Is it just to get my, my brand or my new tool set out to the community and and get some, uh, some engagement and some momentum behind a product? Um, Mm -hmm. do you feel as though like that actually needs to come later once you have kind of a community started to build and then you need to kind of group that? So it's totally coupled with community. And so that's the thing is fostering, building and cultivating a community for developers that use your product is all within the world of developer relations as well. And so, uh, and and it's not always about inventing a new space, but knowing where they exist online. You know, not every developer lives on Twitter. You know, there's just, for some reason, we we think that they are all there, uh, but just and that, you know, some people just do their job nine to five and, you know, then go about their life. And so where are they going online to find answers or to find new things? And so targeting those particular developers also and knowing how to communicate to them in language that feels helpful. And so it's just about creating content that is genuinely wanted by that developer community that will be, uh, will teach them something new, will excite them or give them a good solution for something that they're facing in their day-to-day work. Uh, And then hopefully they'll bring it back to their community or their company eventually one day and say, hey, what if we used this API? Uh, And, and, you know, made sure that they have a good space to do that learning and to feel um, like it's a good community of experimentation and building. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, mm-hmm. For for me to clear to clarify my mind a little yeah. bit, um, uh, I've often heard you know dev avocado developer advocates, mm-hmm. but yep. they are they are truly like in a position so that they're feeling the pain that developers are going through and saying Mm -hmm. your SDK is not how the developers want to use it. It's too painful. That's why we're like losing people versus Mm -hmm. a developer educator. Their, their whole goal in my mind and correct me Mm -hmm. if I'm wrong is to enrich whatever platform that you're on so that the knowledge is easier passed to the individual. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. And they have to work in tandem together. They have to have weekly meetings with one another to know what's happening or to when we get feedback to share that then with the SDK maintainers to make sure that we, uh, you know, are 
prioritizing those pain points so that that happens soon. And the roadmap again is, is modified based on that feedback. But we're, we're user zero, right? We are building things and then writing about how to do that or writing a video or streaming about how to do or to build that app. And so we'll feel that pain as well, right? Yeah. If it's super yeah. confusing about how to create something, I don't want the public to experience that. Right. Like, uh, hold on, this isn't done. And so, you know, being very familiar with the product, but always having the empathy and I don't know, almost the mindset of someone who's never played with it before. You can't become an expert and know it super well and just know where to click and where, how to do it and how to build and yeah. find it in the docs. You have to come at it from the lens of someone who is opening it for the first time, yeah. is signing up for the portal, is, you know, getting an account. Where do you find the API keys and secret? Like just all of that, you have to stay at that student or kind of um, new lens. Yeah. Otherwise it then just becomes like a, the docs and which, you know, you need really polished docs as well, but there's an implied knowledge in a particular space like that. So, but it's not totally one-sided either. It's where you can take from both sides and say, mm -hmm. oh, the developers, yeah. this is a pain point. Like we need to talk about this on this side, but if the company has the API, you can teach the developers exactly. how to I use can, it better. Exactly. And I can take the complex concept, break it down into something that is yeah. comprehensible um, and, you know, building off of models that someone might be familiar with or making comparisons so that we can make sense of this new and figuring out how that person work. learns. Yeah. Like you said, 100%. like different ways of learning. Yep. And having been a teacher before, it's really helpful for me to understand the different modalities of learning and styles of learning. Because for example, when I came into the company, we were Nexmo. That was um, Vonage required Nexmo, the, um, our APIs. And Nexmo ha had pretty much only written tutorials. And so that is really helpful for someone who likes to read the docs and likes to follow something. But for an audio, visual, all of those styles of learners, like someone that wants to get into a sandbox and play and break, we mm -hmm. weren't helping them. And so, you know, that was why Twitch was so important to me. It was why I got really passionate about us creating YouTube videos and um, different lengths of those videos because some learners prefer the really long ones. Others want a one minute breakdown yeah. of it. So just it's that piece. It's hard to piece, please them all too. <laughs> it's so hard. It's impossible, yeah. I think. You and can just you figuring put a lot out, of different yeah. methodologies out there and hope hope one uh, sinks exactly. for everyone. Throw some I was stuff always, at the wall and hope one yeah. sticks. <laughs> yes, and see, like, and then let data inform that, right? Like, okay, obviously our uh, Laravel audience really loves the stream, but our Django mm -hmm. audience really reads the tutorials, whatever it is, and yep. then let, allowing that to continue mm -hmm. the production of that content uh, was I, a lot I've of work. I've heard uh, David East talk a lot about... Um, I can't remember the name of them, but they, they sit through and just say, Hey, can we'll, we'll pay you or whatever to mm -hmm. sit down and go through from the start, how to like work through a product. Um, and he's talked about like, I can't say anything and I'm seeing them click things and like, Oh, don't do that. And like that user testing have, is so have, important. Yeah. Have you, have you ever done that or is that yeah. part of it? Yeah. And what we do is we have, we have, a, we would uh, had a program called developer spotlight where we would pay folks in the community, folks that were building, um, with our APIs already, we would pay them $500 to them or a charity to write a tutorial on how to do something because hopefully they were doing it in innovative ways that we hadn't ever thought yeah. of before. Perfect. And so yeah. exactly. And so just really leaning into understanding how, how they approach it and what problems they had uh, and trying to understand how to remove those hurdles and blockers that people face uh, was really important and just yeah. being really present in the communities and demonstrating that we value your input also is an important piece because it's not rewarding to, you know, share, Oh, this was, difficult for me to do, but then not be able to see any changes ever like that. I don't know. That kind right. of sucks. And you can't build a experience. community. That's not two ways. Like it doesn't work. So exactly. Yeah, cool. for sure. <laughs> well, this is awesome. Your, your story is absolutely incredible. And I, I, it was really exciting to, to hear it again and just kind of go through your journey that you're on. Uh, not only that, but like some of the roadblocks you hit and had to walk away from and, and get into <laughs> yeah. that. that was really incredible. 
Um, Thank you. I think if, if you're good, I am ready to get into our perfect picks. I, I'm excited about your perfect picks. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, so you are actually up first. And I Ooh. always forget to share my screen. Let's do it. Ooh, I, I, okay, yes, uh, this is my friend, Mary. Uh, she wrote a book, uh, it's titled The Business Value of Developer Relations, How and Why Technical Communities Are Key to Your Success. So everything that we kind of talked about in the world of DevRel, I've learned from Mary, of the value of why uh, a company would get a developer advocate um, or um, invest in that developer education program. She lays it all out more eloquently than I ever would be able to. Uh, and so, um, yes, Mary Thangvall, go check that book out. Uh, I, I, I also, love the avocado heads for our, yeah. our listeners. There's a little picture with all kinds of avocados with faces on it. It's awesome. We developer avocado was a thing that stuck <laughs> for, I don't know, uh, it, but it's been around, but it, um, <laughs> It is, it's just really, uh, they're the best, but it's um, understanding the value of why a team would invest in a developer relations team is really important and to have community company buy-in is important for it to be successful. So definitely recommend that. And the other oh. piece, oh yeah, oh, there it is. It's Ada Developers Academy uh, where our um, admissions is open right now. It happens uh, every other quarter. So it is um, an incredible opportunity to learn to code and to be a part of a inclusive, safe, and encouraging learning environment. So it was the best decision I ever made to apply and attend. That's awesome. That's that's a really big tagline right there. Um, <laughs> totally. Oh, and I should have included my podcast too. I need to be better at my own self promotion. Yeah, I think I have some of your links. I could pop it up. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, I'm, we belong. Look at that. Truly, I am truly the worst marketer, and that is like <laughs> I need to be better at it. But I have a Discord channel for folks if they want to participate in the community and and ask our prior guest questions and learn more from them. And I try to just. And invite people on who have had unconventional paths to tech and shout about their experiences and learn about the lessons that they kind of learned along the way and how we frame for our future employers that our background, that even though it's not technical or wasn't a CS degree, is an asset and how we help them understand that as opposed to understanding it as a detriment. It's very cool. It's a good podcast. Go check it out. Thank you. <laughs> That's really cool. I love that you highlight those people and that you yourself went out and you found those opportunities. And if anyone's listening and trying to like learn and find things, just go out, Google, find what you need and then mm -hmm. say yes until you are able to say no. <laughs> That's kind of my motto, like say yes that. to as many things as you can until you have the opportunity to say no. That's yep. beautiful. <laughs> Uh, awesome. My first pick is uh, the CSS Generators blog post by Smashing Magazine. I think it just came out uh, the week of recording, but uh, it was a really good post that kind of puts everything together of the CSS links that are out there for like Bezier curves, um, easing gradients, any kind of site that you can think of that you could go to to find cool CSS tricks, it put them all into one blog post. And I'm like, this is amazing. This is now like bookmarked in my toolbar so I can go there every day. Sweet. Yeah, if you need the link, jump out to the, uh, the blog we'll have for all of it. Your other one's kind and of fun. My second pick is probably one of my favorite things. And I am addicted <laughs> to these pens. If you're watching on video, these are all erasable pens. I have got. I oh, think sorry. Hang on. Let me make you bigger. <laughs> That's intense. There's so many. I have so many of them. And they're just sitting on my desk because I am obsessed with them. They have markers and you can just erase them. So they're called friction erasable pens. And it's literally just friction. So the end of it is just like a rubberish tip. And you just rub on it and it's a little harder than a normal pencil eraser but they come straight off my kids are obsessed with them they what love to the do their homework in them do what can can one pen erase a different pen yes so that is wild. let's see if i can even like a marker oh demo time guys yes uh, demo time 
Let's see. We've got, I can't get it to write, but some pink on there. Let's see if we just take, this is a marker eraser. Wow. I'm, I'm so confused right now. <laughs> I've seen a TikTok <laughs> recently that if that it's, it's, and I heat. didn't turn the page, I promise it's the same page. <laughs> yeah. I've heard that if you put like heat or fire behind it, it will also erase. But then if you put it in the fridge or the, your refrigerator, it'll bring back it and oh. I, I I have I have yet to try it. So I didn't know about that, but I love like just jotting down notes, drawing things. Um, I'm a graphic designer first, and then a front end developer second. But uh, I love to do that. So these were amazing. So if I make a little mistake, I can just erase it out. I love it. I have such bad handwriting illustrations. <laughs> I have to use a computer, so I, I think they're cool though. That's awesome. Okay, uh, I was listening to the, I'm totally dropping the name right now, um, Log Rocket, Pod Rocket, Pod, uh, Pod Rocket Podcast, and on came Christian Boot or Boat, I'm going to get it wrong, but he has this cool little um, package called Goober, and I, I almost just picked it because of the name Goober. <laughs> Goober. <laughs> I used to, when I was in high school, I worked for an Ace Hardware for a hot second, and the guy in there would always say, I go, Alex, go grab that goober over there. I'm like, what are you talking about? So it kind of stuck in my mind at least. And I think it's such a fun name. It'll probably stick in a lot of people's um, minds. But so it, it's what does the package do? What's that? What does the package do? Why the peanuts emoji? <laughs> yeah, so there's a whole story. Go, go listen to Pod Rocket's last one. They'll do a much better job because he lays it all out. But um what he's essentially trying to do is have like this styled components, but uh, it's interesting because this says 12K. Everything I heard on my run was that he was trying to keep it in 1K. There it is. Uh, Less than 1K CSS in JS solution. And hearing him talk about it and how passionate he was like with all of these regex things to pull stuff out, I was like, wow, this is so cool. So if you're looking wow. for something super light, it, it works in all kinds of different places with React and Preact and just JavaScript. It, it was pretty incredible. So uh -huh. check that one out. The second pick, have you guys heard of this this gather yet? Gather I saw Tyler. that on your list. It's it's pretty wild. Um, mm -hmm. So there was a thing at Chrome, uh, the, the Chrome Dev Summit that is very similar to this. Um, where you could like walk around and then you would start interacting and it just popped up in our in our slack feed at work at ost again and i was like man this is such a cool thing i have to feature it i think my son yeah. would love it you can create your own little space so we have like our own ost gather town now and we're thinking about like it's so difficult now to do like demo days and like getting together and stuff like that that will will create areas that you can just go into and be like, hey, I'm demoing. And then like you all get together and pop up on screen and do a demo. It, it's a fun tool that like keeps you all together and immersed. So that was pretty neat. Sounds awesome. Those Super are my neat. Picks. Awesome. Well, thank you so much once again, Lauren or Lolo Coding. Uh, Thanks for knows. having me. Really appreciate it. Um, nice your story you. is incredible. Uh, I wish uh, more people would, you know, take the plunge and figure out what their passion is in life, like you did, and continue that journey. Yeah, Can't wait yeah. to see where you where you go. I'll, I'll keep listening to the podcast for sure. Thank you. Yes, come come join the Discord, everyone, and and come be a guest on my show. I'm always looking for new folks. So if you've had a unique journey to tech, then come hang out on the pod because yeah, it's it's all about celebrating that leap of faith and mm -hmm. discovering passion. So it's a super fun thing to do. It's awesome. awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Bye.